That being said, let's talk about fighting. No, I'm just uh, James chapter 4, verse 1. Where, uh, from whence come wars and fightings among you? It, you know, it, it struck me as odd because James starts out in such a like powerful, like, hey, uh, you can have patience, you can grow, you can be, you know, if you lack wisdom, ask of God. It's like these people are being persecuted for their Christian faith and they're fleeing for their lives and James is writing to encourage them in some way. And he really does a kind of a good job of encouraging like the first 12 verses of the book of James uh, and then after that he starts getting into like their business and like talking about issues that are going on in their personal lives and in their church and he begins to bring up things they're like did he just say that you know is he like he's really bringing that up and opening it in public and addressing uh, th- this issue and here's the one that just really for me kind of takes the cake because he says to this the first church uh, that existed there at Jerusalem, which was scattered because of persecution and some other reasons. Uh, and now he's writing to be an encouragement and to help them to grow. But even his love and encouragement uh, forces him to kind of address some uncomfortable issues. Not to just be, hey, you're great. Hey, you're good. Hey, this is wonderful. God is love and there, we have no problems here. No. Uh, and of his great love and being inspired by the Holy Spirit, he writes in the Bible, hey, Where are the fights coming from? Where's the wars coming from? What's going on with you guys? The word in that first verse, which is wars, is the idea of a corporate conflict. It's like a church that splits over red carpet or blue. You know, like that kind of, you know, kind of, I said last week that lady was like, I hold the key to Pandora's box uh, about this lady when I was a child. Uh, you know, that, that corporate together were warring uh, against each other. The, the word fightings has more the idea of an individual battle. You know, he stole my donut. She took my parking space. She looked at my kid funny. You know, that was my seat. Like those sort of things. I mean, that wouldn't go on in this church, but like other churches that are carnal and wicked, uh, those sort of things kind of happen. Okay, and it's that individual kind of squabbling uh, that goes on back and forth. Now, look, here's the issues that James has addressed so far. Chapter two, favoring the rich and ignoring the poor. You know, there's probably a group of people in there going, hey, we should be nice to these people. God died for them. God loved them. They're creating the image of God. Let's do this. And there are people who go, who cares about them? They don't get any money. They're not going to help us. What we need is money. What we need is connections. What we need is a, a network. Forget about them. Man, you can imagine the division that was going on uh, at, at this time. They, they also, he also addressed selfish dead works in chapter 2 and not having an active faith. And, and there's people in the church that are going, hey, we just, we just got faith. We just believe in God. That's all there is to it. We don't have to actually do anything because it's all into the blood amen we're saved we got eternal life don't need no need to like get fanatical about this jesus stuff we, we believe in god and then there's a part that says no the faith without works is dead let's get active be like abraham be like hagar let's do something uh with our faith and you imagine the the conflicts that there be you come to church and you're doing living acting like a christian and there's a whole group of people in your church that aren't doing anything and man how aggravating and frustrating uh that could be and how that the conflict could come from that then James chapter 3 talks about the untamed speech. Hey, let's control that tongue. I mean, you can imagine he, he, it's enough of a problem that he writes in the Bible to say, hey, let's fix this thing. I mean, it's just one person in a church that has a tongue that is set on fire can, uh, of hell can do a lot of damage. So this is going on in the church, and then he talks about the worldly wisdom. You guys are thinking uh, worldly logic, thinking worldly morals, thinking in worldly ways as opposed to to the heavenly wisdom that is peaceful and making peace uh, and, and sown in righteousness. And, and, and he kind of ends chapter 3 in that. So the fact of the matter is, as I stopped to think about it, I was like, well, no, really, like starting in chapter 2, he really starts nailing uh, some people. Even in chapter 1, he says, don't just hear the word, do the word, you know. Uh, Receive with meekness the engrafted word, be able to save yourself. This church got issues. And I know that the fact of the matter is, is that we have issues too because we're really no different. We're sinners were people just like just like this church was you know sometimes when we have conflict with people we sort of want to blame it on someone else but James says in the second part of verse one don't these things come don't they come not hence even of your own lust that war in your members you know the, the answer to that where do the fights come from well James says it comes from you it comes from me comes from your own 
lust, your own sinful desires, that old, old flesh, uh, that old fleshly nature that you still have inside of you, even though the Spirit has been quickened and made alive and the, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, that our old sinful desires are the ones that begin to stir up conflicts and the wars and the fightings don't come. Can there be right conflict? Can there be a stand for God that's going to cause a disagreement and, 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 and uh, conflict and persecution and hard times? Yes. And that's, that's a whole other subject. James is not addressing that type of conflict. What he's talking about is this envy, this self-promotion, this, hey, I want to be recognized. I want my turn. I want everybody to notice me, how awesome uh, I am. I'm so thankful that we have musicians that are up here. And, and I can't tell their heart, but from what I know of them uh, and their relationship with the Lord, uh, you know, Rick's not up here. He comes up here every week and plays the guitar. And I, I think the last thing that's on Rick's mind is me. Like, I hope people think I'm cool up here. I think people think I'm good. Like, he's going rock, like, he to rock like, 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 like he wants the attention of him. No, he's just up here loving the Lord, praising the Lord, using his talents uh, for the Lord. I'm so thankful for people like that who are just humble uh, in, in serving God. But the fights come when people are like, hey, well, I didn't get recognized. You know, he said Paul's name, but he didn't say my name. He talked about Rick, but he didn't talk about me. And, man, you can see how real fast people get their own Fleshly desires that aren't eternal, that aren't biblical, that aren't spirit-filled, that are selfish and self-promoting, uh, and it gets us all out of whack. We want to blame God. Well, God, you put me in that church. You know, God, you gave me that wife. No, Adam, you know, Adam already used that one. It didn't work in Genesis 1. It doesn't work uh, for you today. James chapter 1, 13, let no man say when I'm tempted, I'm tempted of God. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he doesn't tempt any man. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Where do the fights come from? Where does the conflict in your home come from? Ultimately, it comes from you. It comes from your own selfish desires. But you say, like, well, I, I, it was, I didn't start. I didn't ask who started it. But the fact is, is you didn't end it. And, and it can be ended when there's no selfish desire. When I, I, don't, I don't care. You can win. You can be first. You can have the bigger piece. You can sit in front this week. Ah, you, you pick the show. The same thing goes at church. Oh, it doesn't matter. I, I don't need to be recognized. You know, I'll, I'll do whatever. I'll stack a chair. I'll, I'll help over here. Because I, I, this really isn't about me. It's not about the preacher. It's about, it's, it's about Jesus Christ. It's not the woman uh, that you gave me, Lord. It's me. It's Solomon says that only by pride cometh contention. Paul proclaimed that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So then where did the disagreements in the church and between individuals and in my home and at my office and in my life, where do they come from? I want to show you two aspects of this uh, truth or truths, excuse me, concerning relational conflict. And then I want to give you one step for uh, conflict resolution. Number one in your outline, you want to see that relational conflict stems from my own sinful desires. Relational conflict stems from my own sinful desires. We've already kind of covered this, but he says, where do they come? They come from your own heart's lust, uh, uh, even of your own lust. That is your own desires or your own appetites. The, the, the appetites or the lust that war in your members. Remember in James 3, he says, uh, even so the tongue's a little member and boasts with great things. So what James is now saying, he's kind of connecting to that. He said, he goes, the lusts come from your members. They come from your hands. They come from your feet. They come from your eyes. They come from your brain and your heart and your desires and your ambitions. Those things that are opposed to the things of God. The things that are rebellious toward the things of God. They want you first and, and your way. That's where these fights come from. That's where these conflicts come from. It's not from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is, is righteousness sown in peace of them that make peace. He said that at the end of, uh, of chapter 3. And so these come from our members, from ourselves. Desire uh, determines if we, will have, uh, if we will have a fight or if we will have fellowship. See, if I, if I give in to the desires of my flesh, eventually... We're going to have a fight because someone's going to get in my way. But if I give in to the desires of my spirit, of the Holy Spirit of God, then we're going to have fellowship or peace because it's not about my rights, my way, my respect, my turn, my thing. It really is about loving God and loving others. And so we have to 
well, Paul says it like this, Romans 6, 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it, obey it in the lust thereof. And neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. See, we can let sin reign in our body. We can be saved on our way to heaven, forgiven, a child of God, and we can let sin reign in our body. We can let wars and fighting and conflicts be all around because we're feeding this desire of our flesh. I want mine. I want what's temporal. I want what makes me feel good right now. And Paul says, don't let that reign in your body. Don't let that be in control. Don't feed uh, those sinful desires. Don't yield your members as instruments of righteousness. Don't let the devil, don't let your flesh take your eyes and use them for things that are unrighteous. Don't uh, let your flesh take your mouth and use it for things that aren't right or aren't godly. He goes on to say, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Are you alive from the dead this morning? Oh, boy. (laughs) That was supposed to be a yes. Uh, Somebody somebody told me last week, you said, I would say amen, but you never take a breath. And so, ready? Here we go. Uh, Are you alive from the dead? (gasps) All right, there we go. I'll, I'll work on it if you'll work on it. We'll, we'll get there uh, probably by year 10 or 15. I'm not really sure, but I'm alive from the dead. Okay, so then I can yield myself to God, and my members can be yielded as instruments of righteousness unto God. I, I, I have the actual ability to take my mouth and use it for God's use, not my own fleshly lust use. But where do the wars and fightings come from? They come when I take this desire uh, that the Spirit says, hey, no, 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 don't do that, do this. And my flesh says, just give them a piece of your mind. And I give them a piece of your mind. Okay, that's where the, con- that's where the conflicts uh, in the relationship begin to come. Uh, desires uh, that feed, uh, when I feed that desire, it determines if there will be a fight or if there will be fellowship. Man, if I feed my flesh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna conflict. You're going to take my donut, we're going to... But when, it, you know, when, it's like, when it's God's doing it, then it doesn't matter. It's, you know, whatever. When I, when I want to love someone, I want to make peace, I want to minimize conflict, I want to promote the gospel of Christ and, uh, and, and not get all caught up in, in side issues uh, in, in my life, uh, then when, I, when I'm not concerned about my rights, when I'm concerned about God being glorified, when I'm concerned about shining for Christ rather than selfish ambitions in my life, uh, then, my, then my friend, here's what happens, uh, is that there's fellowship. There's closeness. But here, here, here's the deal. For this, these people, at least, there's a fight. And the reason is because they're tapped into their own heart's lust. Then they got, they've got an agenda. They've got a goal. They've got something uh, that they want to accomplish. They want to be promoted. They want to be seen. They want to uh, have, you know, say what they want to say. They want to not do the word of God. They want to just hear it and live their, live their own way. And James isn't going to let that slide. He says in verse 2, he says, uh, you lust and you have not, so you kill. Um, that's, I, I took a breath, but that's not where you want to say amen. Um, like, like, think about it a second. Like, here, here's, the, here's the point is that delusions follow or accompany disobedience. Because here's, here's what happens. They, they lust, but they don't have. Man, I really I want, I want to be, I want to, and they still don't get it. And so when they're blocked from that goal, guess what happens? They kill. Like, man, I'm not going to that kind of church. You know, like, can you imagine like having sort of kind of a ministry, like we have the murder ministry, you know, come on, like, like what kind of church is this? It's messed up. Now, look, I don't think they're actually killing people as much as in the heart of like the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, if you, uh, you know, the, the law says, the Old Testament says, don't kill. Uh, but I say unto you that whoso, you know, when you look at your brother with hatred in your heart, or you say to him, fool, or rock, like that, that anger, like none of us, if you have, please don't confess it in church today. Uh, I don't think anybody in here, as far as I know, has committed murder, okay? Uh, that, that would probably make us all feel a little uncomfortable, I'm just being honest. Not that we couldn't forgive and God could give grace, uh, but we would be a little nervous that you weren't in jail, okay? I'm just going to tell you right now. Uh, but the fact is, none of us say, we oh, I've committed murder, but how, how many have ever looked at someone and said, wish you weren't alive i wish you would go to i w- man I don't know. that's what jesus was talking about that's what he he's like hey you technically never killed anybody but how many in your sinful heart or lust you just wanted that person if i never saw you again it'd be too soon and that's what jesus is addressing that's what james is saying you you lust but you don't get it you're never going to get it. And that's sort of the, the delusional part. And so 
you kill, you destroy, you tear apart, you scratch and claw every way you can to try to get a hold of this thing that you think that you want. The next parallel sentence there, he just says, you desire to have, but you can't obtain. And so you fight and you war. You want it, and so man, you're like, but but you can never grasp a hold of that. Uh, and and the reason for that uh, is is that we think that if we can get our way or our peace or our turn or our recognition or our spot or if like if I am loved or I'm respected, uh, that we will uh, be satisfied and we can kind of rest in that accomplishment. Man, we've arrived, or man, we got noticed, or we got a five star review, or someone someone recognized that, or I got my turn, or I got I got to be in charge of that, or I've got one of these. I've got ten of these and man now I can rest but the fact is it's delusional to think that because the the Bible says the eyes of man are never satisfied it might kind of take hold for a few minutes but disobedience makes us delusional to the reality that sin never satisfied understand that lust never leaves it simply lingers lust is never satisfied it simply shifts to the next forbidden fruit just out of the reach and man i thought this was going to satisfy i thought this is what i wanted but the fact is that's not going to fill me up like jesus christ but that's not going to fill me up like obedience to the to the lord will it's just something that's temporary and may satisfy for a season but then all of a sudden I, i'm going to need something new i'm going to need something different it's illustrated in this i know for a long time like over a year our kids our boys had wanted a nintendo switch and sort of the attitude in the house has been, if, if we had a Nintendo Switch, we would never need anything. We don't even need macaroni and cheese anymore, Mom and Dad. Like, we just have a Nintendo Switch, and we'll be, we can survive, you know, we can survive forever. And, like, if we had the Switch, and we had this game, and this game, and this game, we would be like, totally, we'd never need another birthday present ever in the face of the history of the world. You know, that's sort of the attitude of the come. You know, this Christmas, my sister and my mom uh, and my dad, they got... Uh, my son's a Nintendo Switch. And man, you should have seen him uh, open up a box and they're, oh man, oh man, and this game and that, oh man, they're so excited and we get it plugged in and we get it situated and, and then like for two days, you're like, where are the boys? <laughs> like, uh, do, we, do we have boys anymore? Like they're down there like, uh, I I'm feel bad for their teachers come Monday morning because they're going to be like, where's the screen? You know, they, they've been staring at the screen for all Christmas break. Uh, and, and so like five days after we had the Switch, Josiah, the middle child, he's got his own tactics of, uh, you, know, he, you know, Elijah uses his voice and the girls use their cuteness. And Josiah just, he's got a scratch and claw for whatever he can do to get uh, some say around the house, you know. And he comes in uh, and he sits next to me. I'm on, the, I'm on the couch doing something and, and he has the console in his hand and he goes, do, 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 uh, and, and, and this is, you know, we're going to learn, like, this is, Josiah wanting to call attention to something like you know, like he's like actual words because uh, you know his he always gets talked over by his brother you know like sort of things are like do 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 and I'm like oh what's that and he goes it's a it's a it's a new game you know and I'm like and those guys at Nintendo are so smart they put the ads like on the consoles now because it's connected to the internet because they're constantly saying you need this to be happy you need this to be happy you need another one the, you know the Mario 17 is out now so come on let's another 60 bucks uh, and and I and, you know and, and I said well buddy we just had Christmas five days ago do, 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 do. Like, so you know it's like uh, and, and do you remember just a few days ago you were on the floor and you're like so excited and thrilled like you didn't even need macaroni and cheese anymore like that's how, how, how satisfied you were with this and like you'd never need another thing in your life and now it's five days later and you're in the living room going do 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 and I'm like buddy we're not we're not going to buy any games today and and probably quite honestly <laughs> for a long time you're like you're gonna have to learn how to live with a few games three or four games you've gotten you know it's like it like goes away <laughs> back to the basement and feel like and like your heart just kind of you know as a parent like break you like I, truthfully I'd buy him every game if I you know if I if I, if I if I could if I thought it was good for him but here here's the thing he's like man this is going to satisfy me so much and then we get it even the best and it, it's not wrong for him and that's part of his flesh and desire I'm not saying he's a wicked sinner in that case he is but that's a whole another <laughs> sermon in itself but like it's just to illustrate the fact that all of us included, we get something that's new, it's like awesome, it's great, man, this is the best ever. I've been, man, I thought this was going to change my life if I get this. And we get it, and it, it might help a little bit, it might do a few things, it lasts for a couple of weeks, but sooner or later, the lust come back. Oh, that guy's got a bigger one. You know, I just had the double X one. Now he's got the quadruple X. Like, I need one. You know, his car's up this high. I want one that goes this high. Like, I gotta, uh, and we just kind of keep doing the race. 
And that's because desires or disobedience causes delusion. He's saying you fight and you roar, but you still don't have it. Man, you're just constantly unsatisfied with all that God's given to you, and, and you're worried that this person is going to get one more turn than you. You're going to worry that this person is going to get one more view than you, and you've got to constantly in this conflict uh, of control and trying to find your place. He goes, this, this isn't the way that it should be. And he says this, he goes, you have not because you ask not. It's interesting the ways in which we try to the ways in which we try to get what we want. In some ways, God just says, you know, you could just ask. Rather than treat people wrongly, rather than ignore the Word of God, I'm not going to go through the book of James again, but all the things we've talked about in there, uh, and using your tongue to try to manipulate your worldly wisdom, try to wiggle your way and get what you uh, want and promote promote yourself, because, you know, you could just ask. Wait a minute, I'm not going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ask for God to, to you know, like, uh, this sort of selfish because, like, it's not, well, yeah, the, the problem is a lot of times we don't ask because we know the answer that we're going to get. No, we're not going to ask God for that. We're not going to pray about that because we know it's wrong. <laughs> It'd be f- sort of weird to come up and say something, you know, God, please give me sin. <laughs> you know, please satisfy my flesh. Please help me to disobey your word. You know, like, you guys are like, no. But, uh, you have not because you ask not. Now, we can look at the positive side of that and understanding that there's things we should, you know, we don't pray for and God would gladly give them if we would. Like in James 1 where he says, if any man lack wisdom, that's really what the discussion here in this book is about. If you lack wisdom about what God is doing and the trial in your life and the hardship and how he's working and he's going to use this for your glory, don't, re- don't res- resort to fleshly ways of like mistreating poor people over rich people and using your tongue out of control or thinking worldly wisdom, go to God. He's the resource. He's the answer. He's, he's the help on this. But he says you, you have not uh, because you ask not. The crazy thing is, is that even when we get what we want, it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy. Relation, relational conflicts come uh, from these wrong goals in our life. There's a book that my wife and I have read uh, this year. My wife read it like 20 times first, and then she made me read it. And I've read it a number of times. It's been a big help to us and to a number of people. But I see it kind of fit in here this morning. I want to share a couple things of it from you. The, think about the readers of James. What were their goals? Like in life. Like as you, what James is writing to fix, it sort of can tell us what the goals of these people were. Well, they, like in, one, in chapter 1, they wanted, uh, they wanted to leave the hardships of the gospel for the niceties of the world, if you can say. And James says, no, let patience have its perfect work. Uh, they wanted to like, do their own thing. They wanted to reject the word of God and not to receive it with meekness. They wanted to hear it. They wanted to go to church. They wanted to be part of the club, but they didn't really want to actually do it. They, they wanted to treat rich people better than poor people that came in their church because, after all, these rich people got connections. You know, the rich people are cool. I can, I can hang out with this guy when we're walking down the street, and people think I'm cool because I'm hanging out with Mr. Cool. You know, like, uh, and so they've got the, these connections. Man, they wanted to say, I believe in Jesus, but they didn't want to actually do anything with it. They, they wanted to use their tongue to advance themselves rather than to edify uh, other people and to build other people up they wanted to use their worldly wisdom so you, you know you think about it it's, it's like the same things that we sometimes get wrapped up in fame fortune influence I want to satisfy my flesh I don't, hey, I, I want to be uh, I don't want to be a r- religious fanatic I don't want to like do anything with my faith I just want to be a Christian and so here, here's the thing is that goals are important because goals determine our behavior all right, so here they've got these goals of, of advancing themselves in, in manners that have nothing to do with eternity and salvation and, and ways that would glorify God. It's all about them. That's their goal. And so it's going to determine their behavior. Like if your goal this year was to lose weight, I would expect that one of your behaviors would be go to the gym. You know, uh, One of your behaviors would maybe eat less Doritos. Like those would be a few things that you would kind of would make sense that uh, I, I didn't say eat no Doritos. I said less Doritos. We're not getting too crazy around here. Uh, but, but that would, my behavior uh, would be altered uh, by my goals. 
If I want to see my friends come to Jesus Christ and I want to shine so that they can know the difference that Jesus makes in their life, then it would probably determine how I behave at work. You know, as opposed to if my goal at work was just to fit in and be one of the guys and not anybody to be uh, intimidated by me or worried about what, uh, then I would, I would act like them and, and just kind of fit in and blend in to them instead of be distinctly different for the Lord Jesus Christ. James contends with his readers and with us as well that, that we should have the goal in our life is that our life would be filled with good works. That is, uh, a life of loving God that flows into a life of, uh, of loving other people. If, if this was their goal, then the fight would be over. And James would be like, I was going to talk to you about these fights, but uh, you guys love each other. You guys aren't worried about getting your peace. You're just, you're, you want to love God and glorify Him, and, and you want to help and serve other people. So, I mean, I'll, I'll save this for later. But no, he writes it out there because their goal is something uh, that's very different. They're, they had a different goal, and so the fights continue. It was their personal agenda over God's agenda. Here's, here's what the author says of this book. He says, when we go out of, out of the door in the morning pursuing our own personal agenda, we become self-absorbed with getting what we think we need, preoccupied with gaining the love and acceptance of other people, that is self-fulfillment, and trying to prevent pain and loss and disappointment. And so we protect ourselves, self-protection, and to whatever degree we pursue our agenda, to that degree we focus on ourselves. The needs of others automatically become a lesser priority. And unknowingly, we end up living as if the great commandment or the royal law, as James says in James chapter 2, uh, said, make sure you get your needs met and never experience any pain. And, and you know, this is like exact. I just see the people that James is writing to. And this fits them to a T. Man, they are looking for self-fulfillment. They are looking for self-protection. They're trying to get theirs and jockey for their position. Uh, and it's consuming their life. And that's their agenda. And that's their goal. And so the behavior just shows it and magnifies it greatly. That when it goes to their life and walking through this world, they're only concerned about them. And the problem is, is that's all of our agendas outside of Jesus Christ. But God has given us the goal to have faith that works, a faith that loves Him and flows into a love uh, for other people. God's goal is for us uh, to love one another, to shine, to be Jesus on display. And if ultimately the key to resolving relational conflict is just that, is to have the goal of loving God and loving others, and then the conflict kind of stops. Even if they're still upset, you know, even if they still got issues, even if they still got problems, like the fact is, is it takes two to tango with this, okay? And so if you're not, if you're not in the dance, then what are they doing, okay? They're just, act, they're just running around crazy out there by themselves, okay? Uh, God's, so we've got to understand, is God's love and grace plus nothing is enough. These people are consumed. They, they believe in God's love. They believe in God's grace, the ability to do God's will, but they, they need one more thing. And that is, they, they, they need to use their tongue to put that person down so they can feel better. And they, they need one more thing, and that, that, that is, they need, a, they need a connection with that rich guy. So they're going to say, hey, poor guy, sit there over there on the footstool, and you come down here in this good place. They're going to have to find a way out of that pickle. So rather than responding with heavenly wisdom, they're going to use, they're going to use earthly wisdom. Instead of making peace, they're going to make conflict. And see, they're not satisfied that God's love and grace plus nothing is enough. And so the truth is, is every day they leave their house, they're scrapping for something to protect or fulfill their life. And that's the same thing we do. See, if we have the right goal, and that is to shine, to be Jesus on display, to, to love God and to love others, and we recognize that we have all of God's love that we need and all of God's grace that we need, and I literally don't need one more thing that's already been given to us. I, you don't have to come to church three weeks in a row to get that. You don't have to have a, you know, stars on your charts for two weeks in a row for, for God to, to give you love and grace. It's already yours. But the problem comes when we don't think we have everything we need from God. We start scrapping with each other to try to get it. Even in our church. Even with people that are part of our spiritual family. We simply don't tap into what God has already given to us 
Like he says in verse 2, you have not because you ask not. See, the positive side of this is that it's not so much that he says, God, I need your love. And he goes, okay, I will now give you my love. No, he already did that. It's not even that guy said, God, I need your grace. He goes, okay, now you will have my grace. The fact is it's already there, but we don't have it because we don't ask for it. Like James chapter 1, verse 5 says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. God, I need to see you in this place. God, I need to see what your goal is to get glory for you and not, and not necessarily for my comfort, not necessarily for my ease, not necessarily so that I have a good week. That's not the goal. A good week, a, a great month, the best month ever, a, a wonderful vacation. That's not the goal of the Christian's life. The, the goal of the Christian's life is to love God and to, to love others, to bring glory uh, to his name. And many times what we're asking for is not what God wants us to ask for, but he says if you if you lack wisdom you can ask me i'll give it to you and and we have not because we ask not and we want god to get rid of that person promote my cause give me one of those i want to win the lottery and none of those things have to do with what god wants for his glory or what god wants in your life and we're kind of missing the whole point of our of our existence and verse three says you ask And you receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. Think back when Jesus had his disciples and lived on this earth. There was a point in the Gospels where one of them, two of them came to Jesus and said, Hey, can can we, in your kingdom, can we sit on your right hand and on your left? Don't tell the other guys because there's 12 of us and they're going to get so jealous. Yeah, I, this is what I find is funny is that uh, the, the front seat argument, you know, like the childhood, I, it's my turn to sit in the front seat. It's as, it's as old as the apostles. Can I have that seat? You know, can I sit there and they're right? Don't tell the other they could can sit in the back. They could be, you know, they could be somewhere else. And, and, God, and Jesus says, look, number one, it's not mine to give. It's God's to give. The crazy thing is they were asking for Jesus' seat. I mean, they just didn't even know what it was. They were totally asking amiss to consume it upon their lust. And uh, he said, in fact, he goes, that's not how this kingdom operates. It's not about who sits at the right hand and has a place of prominence. He goes, hey, you really want to be great in this kingdom? Then be a servant. Be a minister. The least on this earth will be the greatest in heaven. And that's why Jesus will be the name of and is the name above all names, and uh, we can have and share in that glory too if we're willing to follow the rules uh, of his kingdom. Someone says, you know, uh, you know, pray, God, give me a million dollars. God, I, I, God if, you, if you let me win the lottery, like you know, the $90 million, I promise I will, I will bless my church like, like, and like nobody ever blessed my church. Now, like, I've heard that a thousand times. I can't remember people have said to me, and it doesn't offend me. Look, if you win the lottery, you, you bless this church all you want, and we're going to, you say, you're going to take money like that? Yeah, because I don't ask where your money come from. I ain't going to ask where their money come from. We're not going really to ever interview anybody on that. I'll gladly receive it, and it'll be the best lottery money ever used for the glory of God. Uh, but here's the thing. And even in our asking in that, here, here's the, the truth is, is that in, in our flesh, we're sort of like, we just want the money for us. We want the money so we can quit work. We want the money so we can just uh, go live on a mountain somewhere, go live down by the ocean somewhere. And, I, and God, if I'll just kind of tack this religious bow on the end of it, so maybe I'll kind of manipulate you to give me what I want. And God's no dummy. You know, if, you had, if we had the right intentions with that money, he might actually let you win. But the fact is you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss. That would consume upon our lust. God, take care of that guy. Put him in his place. Why? So you can be right? Or so that God can be glorified? Yeah, I just I want people to recognize me for all the good and you know, all the talent. That, why? So that God can be glorified or so that you can get praise and people can, man, you're awesome. And that's what's going on in this church. They're, they're all caught up in the politics of office life, of church life, of work, and they're getting so off the mark, off the point. And he says, look, you gotta, you, you ask and you don't receive. You ask and miss. Why? So you can consume it upon your lust. God, make these people respect me so that they know that I'm important, smart, successful, valuable. And God says, well, that's not the goal. That's your agenda. And God says, I have no desire to answer that prayer. It's from our sinful desires is where conflicts come in your marriage it's partly your flesh in church it's it's your flesh at work 
It's your flesh. But also, I want you to see number two, is that relational conflict stems from worldly values and worldly desires. You know, it's like, well, it's like what the flesh starts, the world will be glad to push it a little farther. Oh, you need some gas for that? And, you know, fire? Like here, and the world just kind of kind of poured onto you. Here's what James says in verse 4. Get ready because this gets kind of rough. He says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Hey, what would you think if I came up to you this week and I point my finger in your face and I said, you're an adulterer. You're an adulteress. You think you would, you might laugh, but you're like, what is he talking about? Has he lost his mind? I mean, like, and here's the thing is like, James is writing to the, the, the first scattered church of Jerusalem and as he's writing, it seems like the letter starts out pretty good. Like, hey, they're just going through a hard time. They need encouragement, whatever. But he's just not going, oh, lovey bear, huggy bear, kissy bear stuff. Like he calls out and he goes, you guys are a bunch of adulterers. You're, you're adulteresses. You are, you are cheating on God. With who? Well, he says, hey, friendship with the world is enmity with God. Hey, being a friend of this world not, not, not being a friendly neighbor, okay? We're not talking about loving your neighbor and that sort of thing. But what we're discussing here uh, when he says this is that, uh, that we have, um, I lost my place and I can't find it. Where am I at here? There's my place. Say so we become attached and partial to the world's values and the world's morals and the world's logic and goals and affections and ambition. For these people, it was men over money. It was a critical spirit over controlled speech. It was human wisdom over heavenly wisdom. It was to be seen and not to serve. And James calls them out and he says, look, this, these kind of ways of thinking, this logic and this ambition and this self-promotion, that is not what the church of Jesus Christ is about. You guys have become friends with the world. You've been attached to the things that are temporary and to its values and to its goals uh, and to its affections. The friendship assumes that there's a close association or mutual interest. James, you know, it's like, oh, we're, we're buzz. We watch, we watch football together. Oh, you know, me and her, we, we go shopping all the time. We're just, you know, uh, you know her and I, we got, we've, we've got kids in the same grade. And so we're just really like, and there's a, a mutual connection to kind of build uh, that friendship. We used to work together, you know, uh, kind of thing. And, that, and, we're, and we're friends and nothing wrong with that. But there's wrong, something wrong with a, someone who's a Christian, a, someone who's a, a saved child of God, being a friend with the world, having mutual interests that are aligned with the sinful philosophy of Satan the sinful philosophy of this temporary world to be caught up in the madness and the rat race of living for yourself instead of for God. And he says, you guys, you guys are adulterers, adulteresses. He says, you're a friend with the world. The, the word world has the idea of the ethical sphere uh, of human values that are in opposition to the divine values, like, like atheism. Hey, there, I don't, there's no God. Why is that so popular? Well, because if there's no God then I don't have to answer to a God, and then I become God, and I can do whatever I want. And, and then if we're just an accident, just a, you know, like it's just one big bad science experiment that went right somehow, uh, then I can just kind of, I'm not creating the image of God, I'm not going to stand before him one day, I can, I can live however I want, it's my body, I can do what I want. Hey, if, if there's nothing after this life, then I'm just going to live for the moment. I'm going to live for money. I'm going to live for sex. I'm going to live for materialism. I'm going to live for these things. Just fulfill my desires right now. And, and that's what he's talking about. You become a friend of the world. You're caught up in all these temporal things. Your logic is so messed up and perverted uh, in that it's thinking in a, in a worldly, logical way. It makes sense to everybody who doesn't know Jesus Christ. It makes sense to those who hate on Jesus, who spit on Jesus. And that makes you, makes you an adulterer. That makes you an adulteress. Here's the deal. It's the old saying. A two's a company, and three is a crowd. Yeah, it's, it's got to be you and Jesus, or you and the world, but these three things don't go together. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. 
Hey, you want to be a friend of the world and get caught up in all the things that don't matter and that appeal to your flesh and will satisfy your flesh for momentary status? My friend, have at it. But you will find yourself on the other side of the line with God. Friendship with the world, the mutual interest with the world uh, is, is enmity against God. Jesus said no man can serve two masters. Either he will love the one and hate the other, or hold the one and despise the other. But no man can serve God and mammon. In John 15, he says, if, you, if the world hate you, know that it hated me before it hated you. And if you were of the world, the world would have loved his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant isn't greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. So look, the world hates me. And if you're on my side, if you're on my team, they're going to hate you too. And that's just the way it is. And when, they're, when, when you're kind of buddy-buddy and tell me, oh, okay, hey, we can be on the same time. Why? Because we have the same interests and have the same goals and have the same affections in the same direction. And God has a problem with that. He's a wonderfully jealous God. He loves you enough to say, no, it's just me and you. Hey, what would you think if your wife didn't mind if you messed around on her? We'd say, how, how selfish of her. She just doesn't understand. You know, like, she, she's just so mean and so selfish. No. That's a, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to be jealous. And why couldn't God, the creator of the universe, the savior of your soul and my soul, he has every right to be jealous and say, hey, I'm the God. One and only. He says, no, this friendship of the world stuff. Oh, we're just friends. We're just, we're just hanging out. No, no, no. That's not how he does this thing. Friendship of the world is, is enemy. Hey, when you follow me, they hated me, they're going to hate you. And, and, and you have to understand that that's just the, the way it is. And if, 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 they, if the things of this world don't sort of oppose you, rub you the wrong way, and, and don't uh, kind of, hold, you know, like fight against you as a Christian, you sort of probably ought to wonder wh- who's your friend. But as you begin to live peaceably, as you begin to obey the Word of God, not just hear the Word of God, and treat people fairly because they're creating the image of God, and control your tongue, and use worldly wisdom, you'll begin to find that the people of this world, the things of the devil, and this fear that opposes God, uh, it, it's going to find you. You're not going to be buddy-buddy, chum-chum with them, because they're going to they're push you out. They hated Jesus. They hate you too. And it's not our goal to have them hate us, okay? Uh, we can be good neighbors, we can be honest, we can be, do the right thing, but that's still the natural friction of the place that we live is they're going to oppose Jesus. Hey, who's the, what's the only name that people don't want to pray in publicly in our nation? Jesus. That just, that's just illustrates for you the fact that this world is not the friend of Jesus. And so if you're the friend of the world, you just can't have both. 1 John chapter 2, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Just one simple illustration. Look, if, if you take your life, and you make it about money, man, that's going to make me happy. That's going to make me successful. That's going to fulfill me. I'm just going to, uh, hey, I am not opposed to you being rich. I'm not even opposed to you winning the lottery if, if you give to the church. No. Well, for, sorry, forget I said that. I'm sorry. I should say. But you know why God doesn't want you to live for money? Because one day it'll pass away. Like, <laughs> probably more, more correctly, you'll pass away, you know. Uh, all of us have had some money in our pocket before. Like, man, oh, yeah. And they're like, where did that go? You know, here's a spin. I just went to Walmart one time. And like, he's like sucked around my pocket. It's like, this is going to go. And if, if our life pursuit is wrapped up in making money, the world will pass away. And you'll have those 40 years or 80 years or 110 years, and it'll be pointless. God isn't trying to make you poor the rest of your life. He just doesn't want you to waste the life that he gave you and the life that he saved when it could bring so much glory to him. So he says, don't get in love with the world. 
Don't do it their way. Don't act like them and that philosophy and that spirit because that stuff's going to pass away. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The adulterers and adulteresses, it's like he told the nation of Israel in Jeremiah 3, Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so ye have treacherously with me, dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel. It's loving the world's values and pursuits and affections. Romans chapter 8, For the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, so that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. 2 Timothy 4.10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. It's claiming to be a Christian, but yet finding a real love and real pleasure in the things that Satan offers through this world. The devil would love nothing more for you to get consumed in the pursuit of material possessions so that you're too busy to think about things that will last and really matter in this earth. God's not against you being rich. He's not against you being rich on this earth. He just doesn't want you to be poor in heaven. And that's why we've got to take these affections and we've got to change them. Look, we've too long perhaps straddled the fence. Look, if there were adulterers and adulteresses in the first church, scattered church of Jerusalem that James is writing to, my friend, can I say this? There are adulterers and adulteresses in this room right now. You're cheating on God. And you know exactly the way in which you're doing it. And time and time again, God has tried to get your attention. The Holy Spirit has convicted you. You've read it in His Word. You've heard it preached from this pulpit. And yet, you deny it. Yet, you're delusional. Yet, you continue to scrap and claw and try to say, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to get my thing. I don't care what God wants to do. I'm just going to step over that person and crush that person and move. I'm going to get mine. And James is calling us out. Here's the thing, is that friendship with the world is primarily an attitude of the heart. So we must cultivate a new affection. I I get it, I get it that we can be wrapped up and like, I just don't know how I could live anywhere else. I don't think how I could think anywhere else. I'm just so addicted to this thing or this food or this habit or this magazine or this video game, uh, you know, and this this stuff or treating people this way or talking this way or I've been focused on living for money for 30 years of my life. How all of a sudden am I going to switch that and go to a a different vein? What do I do? Well, the thing is we've got to set our affections in a different place. We've got to take those desires uh, and, and, and why, why um, well, let me, let me say it like this. When we were first married, my wife wanted a dog. She wanted a dog. But it didn't be any dog. It had to be a dog that didn't shed. And all I know about dogs like that is they cost money. You know, like before, you're just like, oh, there's a dog running down the street. Let's take that one home. You know, that, that's what you do when you live in Sullivan, Missouri. You just, you know, go down to the pound, pay like 10 bucks to take a dog home. But she wanted one of these fancy dogs that cost money. We were out preaching in Kentucky at my dad's church one time, and uh, she's looking in the paper. She's like, for weeks, been kind of thinking about this. And she's really, wanting, they're like, which kind? And she's like, oh, there's this Morky. It's a Maltese and York Terrier. It's like, great dog. It's a big, doesn't shed, you know, small dog. And uh, she goes, there's one for $450 uh, over in Hazard, Kentucky. I mean, First of all, I'm not sure you should ever buy anything from Hazard, Kentucky, but uh, especially if someone's breeding dogs over there. But, uh, you know, so here's what I said to her one night. I was like, we're going to bed. I was like, please not bother me with the dog thing again. I was like, look, if God gives you the money to buy the dog, we'll buy the dog. But other than that, we're not, we're not buying a dog. And I just said that not as, I didn't say that in faith, understand. I was just saying that like I wanted to forget about the dog thing. We don't need a dog. So the next morning, my mom goes to work, and when she gets to work, her boss finds out that we're in town. Her boss calls me and says, hey, he goes, I hear you're in town this week working for the king. Uh, and, and not Elvis, but Jesus, who he was talking about, you know. And uh, I said, yes, sir, we're here preaching this week, work for the king. He goes, hey, he goes, I like people that work for the king. He goes, come down to the office and see me. So we go down to his office, we step in, it's this weird, eccentric, old, rich guy. Uh, and he's very kind and gracious, but he's also weird and eccentric, or he was, he's passed away. Uh, since, but uh, as we got to talk with him and spent some time there, he goes, here's what I'm going to do today. He goes, I'm going to give you $1,000. He goes, I want you to tithe on it. He goes, don't be stealing from God. You give 10% to God like you should, you, you would take that to your church. He goes, and then I want you to take the rest of it. The 900 is left over, and he goes, I want you to give half to your wife, and I want you to give half to my wife. <laughs> and then he said this, and we hadn't talked to him about anything. He goes, and she can do whatever she wants with her half. <laughs> and you can do whatever you want with your half. 
And I just sat there in the office and was like, thank you, sir. Praise the Lord. Like, you know, it's like, I was like, he's like, so what are you doing today? And I'm like, we're going to Hazard, Kentucky. That's what we're doing, that's what we're doing today. Like, I know this is, already, this is already coming. So we went to Hazard, Kentucky, and man, when we saw him, it's just like our, our heart and our affection. It's just like, oh, he's just so perfect, so cute, and he's so small, and he's so tiny, he's so wonderful. Uh, and we brought Tucker into our life. And we, you know, we spent, t- my wife had spent weeks, you know, thinking about it. And then we, we got him, and we just were so careful to take care of him and walk him and do all the things that you have to do. You know, a couple weeks later, it was Sunday night before Easter, uh, and I'm sitting in the emergency room vet because one of the teenagers at our church dropped the dog and he broke his paw. Here's what I want to tell you. If someone gives you $450 and your wife $450 and she spends it on a dog, spend yours quick because if you save it, <laughs> you're going to spend it on a vet bill. That's all I'm going to tell you. That. That's how it's going to work right now. So quick, buy a gun, you know, do something that manly with it because otherwise you're going to spend it on, on that. You know, that's where my $450 went, uh, was, to buy, was, to, was to buy the vet bill and a couple little cute casts that went on. People would say, this is what people tell us. When you have a child, you won't love that dog like you do now. I said, oh, no, listen. Like, I don't know what your dog's like, but this is Tucker. You know, like he goes ever. like he went to the office at church with me sometimes. He would sit at my desk and just be there with me in the office. He went on every ride that he could go on. He'd go with me and roll the window down that Saturn view, and my arm would be on the window, and his would be up there, and he'd, you know, he'd just, he'd love it. He went ever with us. He slept at the foot of the bed after we couldn't stand just squealing and crying anymore. He used to stay right there, you know. Uh, and, yeah, we had some problems and some potty control stuff, you know, that we had to work through. Uh, and he's just, just so, like, this is our dog and then one day we went into the hospital now this was me because I was sympathy eating and then my wife and then my wife we went to the hospital uh, and she had we had Elijah and we didn't know his name we didn't know who you know what sex the baby was when it came out uh, and Jenny's like what is it what is it and I said it's Elijah it's Elijah he, he's here and, and, and that boy with that deep little cry and, and all the doctors going oh my goodness they said you're going to stand up and call him service 10 pounds and, and two ounces and we wrapped him up and we had him in the hospital there and we were holding him and you know just like minutes later someone says hey you gonna feed your dog down like dog what like I don't, I don't know what you're talking about you know I, I have no clue I don't even care about the dog anymore it wasn't a few months later maybe a year later we moved into a new home and a new carpet and new baby and uh, and one day I'm at the office I get a call from my wife she goes look it's the dog or me she's like one of these things has got to go he's got fleas and he's peeing all over the carpet he was so ticked off that he had been replaced uh, by Elijah that he just was out of control. And so the truth is, today, I don't know if Tucker's alive. I don't know if the family we gave uh, him away to ate him or kept him or, you know, whatever. Uh, but he's gone. And the truth is, I don't care. I don't. And here's why. It's because I have a different affection today. Nine years later. Ten years later. No, I'm kidding. He'll be ten in March. <laughs> uh, that doesn't really matter because one is clearly more valuable than the other. And my friend, what James is telling his church and what he's telling us today is this. Sometimes we're adulterers and adulteresses. And we run off and play the whore with things of this earth. And we have a loving God who patiently waits to forgive and for us to return. Relational conflict with God, relational conflict with one another comes from our own lust. It also comes from the world and its desires and pleasure. The world will be more than happy to pour fuel on your fleshly fire. So <laughs> then what do, we, what do we do exactly? Well, thankfully this morning... God has an answer for it. And we see, number three, God's plan for relational resolution or conflict resolution. Here's what he says. He says he gives more grace. He giveth more grace. Look, I hope that perhaps this morning, it, look, if you're a spiritual adulterer like James says you might be, or an adulteress, I hope this morning that in some way, not by me, but by the Holy Spirit of God, you feel exposed. You feel caught. You feel convicted 
for the spiritual adultery that you commit. I, I do. That's my prayer. That's what I've prayed all week long as I know we're going to come to this point. I said, God, I pray that even myself as I preach would sense the Holy Spirit saying, you are wrong. You're living a sin. You've gone away. You're cheating on me. But you know, that kind of makes people feel awkward and weird. And a lot of times people want to run away from the church. They want to run away from the preacher. They want to run away from God when they've been caught. But here's the thing. God says, no, I want to give you something. I want, to, I want to give you grace. I want to give you the ability to get things right. I, I want to extend to you something that you don't deserve. Yeah, you've messed up again, uh, and, and yet there's more grace. So I don't know where you might find yourself this morning, and right about now you might feel like the lowest of the lows, and like, man, I have blown it again. I am so far off. I'm just... I can't, I just never get it right. It is not about you getting it right, my friend. It's understanding this, is that I don't want to be a friend of the world. I want uh, to, I want to be the friend of God. I want to follow him. Uh, and, and thankfully, God says, I want to give you grace. He's not repulsed by you. He's not kicking you out. He's saying, you get one more chance. No, he gives more grace. Therefore, God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So how do we get this grace? Because I'm going to need it in my life. If I'm going to be helped and to be faithful to my Savior, here's what he says. We need to submit to God. I need to put myself under God and His Word. I need to be willing to do it His way, not my way. His wisdom, not my wisdom. His tongue, not my tongue. His treatment of people, not my treatment of people. His, his remaining under the load and the way He wants. His doing the Word, not just hearing the Word. His receiving the Word. All the things that James talked about. We're going to do it, we're going to do it His way. I'm going to submit myself to God. I'm going to put myself under him i'm not going to be my own man i'm a, i got this i can do it just give me one more try i've got pride I'm, i don't need god telling me what to do I, i'm in control of me I, i'm my own person no you need to submit to god say god i'm wrong you're right my way gets in the mess i'm, I'm going to in your mess and then he says this resist the devil i personally think that resisting the devil happens when i submit to god because what do i do when i submit to god and i obey his word but I think there might be a little extra thing needed or this little emphasis would be this, is that sometimes we, we're so uh, defeated in spiritual warfare and battles because we don't even put up a fight anymore. But by faith, if we would resist a little bit, if we put a little, like the devil says, hey, come do this. And we go, no, not today. You know what the Bible says? He flees. And some of us are just like, oh, I can't help it. It's just the way I am. I've been doing it for 30 years. I'm like, oh, I just, you know, my brother, I, I got uh, and, and you don't know resisting, no fleeing. But when I submit to God, okay, God, do it your way. Immediately. That brings in, hey, I'm obeying God's word. I'm doing it his way. That is resisting the devil. Guess what? He flees. He's got to run. He's got he's to run away and figure out, okay, I've got to find a new way to attack this person because that old way is not working. Man, they're starting to put up defense. They're starting to put up a fight. I gotta, I gotta, we got to rethink this and come back, come back later. But resist the devil. He'll flee. He goes on to say this. He goes, draw nigh to God. Hey, I, I know there's no doubt in my mind that some people are like, I am never coming back to a place where I sit there for 45 minutes and that guy calls me adulterer. Look, I didn't do that. Jesus did. And what he wants you to do is he says, draw nigh to me. Hey, if it was me calling the shots, I'd say, yeah, you cheat on me. Get out of here. I mean, that's sort of what I don't do in my flesh. God says, no, draw nigh to me. And why there be a temptation to run and hide from God and keep that in the dark so that no one really ever finds out what's going on in your secret life? The fact is, God already knows. He says, if you'll bring that to me, I'll give you grace. Draw nigh to me, and I'll draw nigh to you. And he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Let's, let's get rid of that filth. Let's get rid of that mess, the way you treat people the wrong way or the things that you're looking at in that magazine. Like, let's get rid of that. Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You've you got, you got two minds, one for the world and one for heaven. Let's, let's get a single focus here on things that matter, on things. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And he says this, be afflicted and mourn. This is, let your laughter uh, be churned to mourning and your joy into heaviness. You know, I wish I could sort of get to the end of this paragraph and they'd be like, but he, sa- he says, let your laughter, don't laugh about it. You're like, ah, we're okay, everything's fine, I'm doing good, I'm, I'm in control, I've got it going on, oh, this is fun, this is great. And no, our heart needs to break about that sin because we're cheating on God. 
But you know, the wonderful thing about it is, is that when we come to God and agree with Him about our sin, our adultery, we say, God, I'm out. I messed up. I, I, mean, I don't know how I got so wrapped up in that thing. It just doesn't matter. It stole my affection for you. And I, I, I was wrong. God, you got to please forgive me. God, give me the... I know I don't deserve it. I feel so ashamed to be, be here. But God, I, I need your grace. I need to see where it's at. I need to uh, feel it in my heart, in my life. And God, uh, he says, and he gives more grace. But many times it's not going to come through unless... We get real about our sin. Uh, you know, my prayer this morning, I was here this morning, I walked around this room, and I said, God, please help the people that hear this sermon today, not just think, oh, I go to church, I'm fine, I'm not one of those people, but no, to understand that James is writing to people that go to church, uh, and this message today is given to people that go to church, and that we wouldn't just kind of roll it off our shoulders and think that it's not a big deal, but to understand uh, that there are times when this sort of thing creeps into our life, and that God would break our hearts over the areas in which we become a friend of the world and the enemy of God. So that we'd be willing to let it go, to cleanse our hands, to be afflicted and mourn over that and to see it how God sees it. And then to experience the forgiveness of God. To experience uh, the welcomeness of God. Uh, to, to experience the love of God. To experience the grace of God that comes in, into our life. To to be able to leave here this morning with a clean conscience, with a pure focus, with conflicts resolved between us, between each other, maybe in your marriage or even a conflict that you may have with God. God says, I give more grace. In the last verse, He says, Humble yourself, for, therefore, under the, uh, in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. You know, God will either resist you in your pride or He will assist you in your humility. I'm convinced this morning the Holy Spirit has spoken to many hearts in this room. So here's what happens. God points it out. And now you've got to be willing to say, you know what? you're right, I'm wrong, I submit, I resist, I cleanse, I purify, I want to receive your grace. Or you can go, I don't care what God says. I, yeah, I heard the word, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to receive the word with meekness like, like someone's going to tell me what to do. And you'll leave in your pride. And the Bible says God will resist you. Hey, you ever turning up the resistance on the exercise bike at the gym? And someone's like, what's the gym? <laughs> it's like this place that the machines like an exercise. Like, eh, you know, I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, and you're like, I'm going to turn it up to 10. I I'm even doing this like it's an old exercise bike. You know, it's like, do, 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 do. Like resistance, 30. And you're like pushing harder and harder and harder. It's like, no, like let's turn that thing down to one. I'll make it a lot easier to go. I don't know, that's, that's the idea. I'm going through life and in my pride and in my own thing. And do my own, I'm, I'm going to, I don't care what God thinks. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to be adultery. It doesn't matter uh, to me. God says, hey, okay, you can go that way. You can pedal through your life that way but I'm going to resist you and man everything that you do and everything you go through there's going to be a struggle because God loves you and he wants you to repent and he wants you to come back to him and he wants to have fellowship with you and he wants the conflicts to be resolved and he wants people to make peace and he wants to be at peace with you too he resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble it's either that he resists you today or that he assists you today the, the, the picture is of someone who's been hurt or fallen and someone comes alongside and picks up their eye. I see this on the football field a lot. Someone get injured you know, and they put the guy's arm over his shoulder like this and they have a hand underneath his, his arm over here and they kind of walk off the field together. Here, let me help you. The question is, where do you want God? Do you want God like this in your life? Or, or do, you want him, do you want him like this in your life, pushing against the very thing you're trying to do? I think the choice is obvious, but the deal is that it takes humility. How do we resolve a conflict? Humility. Honey, I was wrong. I'm sorry I took the last piece of fried chicken. I know that was yours. I'm sorry. Humility. Hey, kids, you know, daddy shouldn't have yelled like that. You're going to have to forgive daddy for, for, for doing that. Hey, Chris, I, really, I just really blew it. Like I said that to you out in the lobby yes, last week, and I was just, that's just, that's, it wasn't right. I was wrong. Conflict resolved. God, 
the last three weeks, I've just been on this thing. I've been so far, my heart has not been satisfied in you alone, and I've been trying to fill that void with other things of this world. It just doesn't, just not cutting it. I need some new affections. I've got to let go of that. i got to get, it's like the Tucker and the Elijah thing where I've got to set my affections, Colossians 3, set my affections on things above, but not on things of this earth. So this morning, if you're guilty of adultery with God, the answer isn't to run. The answer is to come, to draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. Let's pray.